I recently spent a few bucks on a used copy of a 1963 humor book called Will Success Spoil Jeff Davis? Early on, it presents a list of 10 qualifications to be an amateur confederate, the last of which is hate Jefferson Davis. By that measure, there were plenty of amateur confederates in the original convention that created the new government and even in Davis's cabinet. As early as February 28, 1861, the South Carolina diarist Mary Boykin Chestnut, whose husband had served in the U.S. Senate with Davis and was a delegate to the convention in Montgomery, Alabama, wrote, What a pity to bring the spites of the old union into this new one. It seems to me already men are willing to risk an injury to our cause if they may in so doing hurt Jeff Davis. Davis's campaign for the presidency, if you can call it that, consisted of a letter from Mississippi where he had returned after resigning from the Senate to one of the delegates, saying that he had no confidence in his ability to be president and would prefer not to, but in this hour of my country's severest trial will accept any place to which my fellow citizens may assign me. So how the hell did he get the job? The first thing to keep in mind is that the electorate consisted of the delegations from the first six states to secede from the Union. South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, and Louisiana. Texas had also voted to secede on February 1st, but its delegates were still en route to Montgomery. The way the selection process worked, each state got to cast one vote, which was determined by the majority of its delegation. In an 1879 interview with the Philadelphia Times, Robert Toombs of Georgia, Davis's first Secretary of State, would complain, perhaps not entirely inaccurately, that if the vote had been cast by delegates rather than by states, he could never have been elected. Early in the proceedings at Montgomery, Toombs's name had been talked up, but two or three nights before the election, he had too much to drink at a party and made a fool of himself and this came after having been noticeably tipsy each evening throughout the week. As historian William C. Davis writes in A Government of Our Own, The Making of the Confederacy, how could the delegates place their trust and the fortunes of their new nation in a man so apparently unable to control himself? At best, a convivial glass or two of wine over luncheon with some dignitary or diplomat risks severe embarrassment. At worst, in the event of war, a tipple too much at the wrong moment could cost them far, far more. Toombs was blindsided to learn at the last minute that he was all but out of the running, and in that 1879 interview claimed that Carolina was for Davis all the time. He suited the extreme views of that state, and Robert Barnwell Rhett held the delegates well in hand. He was incorrect on all counts. Rhett had written after the war that he doubted Davis's fitness for the presidency due to inconsistencies in principles regarding disunionism and a lack of intellectual ability. Rhett's first choice for president was Rhett, but failing that, he claimed he would have preferred Thomas Cobb of Georgia, whom Rhett called pious, honest, earnest, able, and brave. Altogether, I thought the best man in the Congress. Indeed, many assumed that Georgia, as the largest state in the Confederacy until Virginia joined a few months later, would get the presidency. But there was more delegate chatter about his brother, Hal Cobb, who had been elected president of the convention, but was mistrusted in his own delegation, and still more about Toombs's friend, Alexander H. Stevens, a cooperationist who had voted no in the first round of Georgia's secession convention. That fact worked in his favor, even with fire eaters like South Carolina's Lawrence M. Kite, who disliked Jefferson Davis and shocked Stevens by approaching him to ask if he would accept the presidency. As William C. Davis writes, such a move would be bound to conciliate the fears of the border states while bringing into the fold the conservative cooperationist element in all of the states. Stevens briefly flirted with accepting, but told another Georgia delegate that making him president would be like 
taking a child out of the hands of its mother and giving it to a stepmother. Someone who has been identified with the cause should be chosen. Meanwhile, Tom Cobb, notwithstanding Rhett's professed high opinion of him, tried to head off the possibility of Stephen's election by falsely telling other members of delegations that Georgia planned to nominate his brother Hal, offending, at the very least, the South Carolinians. One by one, they began shifting their support to Jefferson Davis, with Rhett's cousin Robert Barnwell persuading Rhett to swallow his doubts about the Mississippian. Florida's tiny delegation followed South Carolina's lead, and Louisiana's preferred a president from a river state over a Georgian. Alabamians considered backing fire eater and native son William Lowndes Yancey, but no real support developed, and the delegates thought Hal Cobb had too much baggage, most recently his service in the universally unpopular U.S. President James Buchanan's cabinet. According to Toombs, again in that 1879 interview, Jefferson Davis secured the Alabama delegation by one vote, by means of what trickery I will not discuss. When the Georgia delegation gathered to make its decision, Stevens and Martin J. Crawford lobbied for Toombs, but just before the vote, Tom Cobb, realizing that his ruse had failed, told them he'd heard that Alabama, Florida, and probably South Carolina had already declared for Davis. Mississippi's vote was a foregone conclusion. Toombs did not want his name presented with no chance of winning, so he sent Crawford to canvass the other delegations to confirm the rumors, meanwhile convincing Stevens to accept the vice presidency if he received unanimous support. The rumors indeed proved true, and the next day, in secret session, the convention, now the Provisional Confederate Congress, unanimously elected Davis and Stevens Provisional President and Vice President, respectively. Rhett came to regret voting for Davis, the most deplorable act of my life, he would eventually write, a mere three days after the inauguration, when the Provisional Congress voted to provide him with a rented mansion, which Rhett deemed an unconstitutional breach of the Emoluments Clause. It's a nice house. You should check it out if you're ever in Montgomery. Davis was helping his wife Verena with rose cuttings in the garden at his Mississippi plantation, Briarfield, when he got the telegram on February 9, 1861, informing him of his election. She later recalled that he looked so grieved upon reading it that she thought something awful must have happened to a family member. After a few minutes painful silence, she wrote that he shared the news as a man might speak of a sentence of death. And that's how you get elected president of a new country without really trying. Davis and Stevens were elected to a full six-year term without opposition on November 6th. This was the first of what I hope will be many viewer-generated episodes, so if you've got an idea for a story you'd like me to research and tell, please drop a suggestion in the comments. For more about the early days of the Confederacy in Montgomery, uh, head over to my website, antebellumetc.com, where you can also sign up for my free newsletter, which comes with my YouTube videos embedded in a post with additional contact. You can click the link in the description below. And help this little channel grow by subscribing, hitting that like button, and sharing with anyone who might be interested. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode.